So why is this important? So this is basically if you want to write down in words what happens, it's produced by the tryptophan and tryptophan hydroxylase, put into the vesicle and released into the synaptic cleft, working to do one of three functions. Cross the cleft and bind to the receptors, bind to the presynaptic receptors, or be recycled. Well, what does this have to do with major depressive disorder? Well, it has been said that the serotonin transporter gene is the most studied in major depressive disorder. So do you guys remember what the serotonin transporter does? Can somebody tell me? Lisa, three seconds. Exactly. So, the gene contains a polymorphism, which means it can have two different, uh, it's a variation in a gene. So, it can lead to two different alleles. Does everyone remember what an allele is? Yeah? Okay, it's an alternate form of a gene. So, uh, let's say eye color in humans that has an allele because you can have the allele for blue eyes or brown eyes or green eyes. So this can lead to, so the serotonin transporter gene has two alleles, a long one and a short one. The long allele increases the synthesis of the serotonin transporter. And that's thought to be more easily transcribed. We all remember DNA transcription. Well, um, the DNA is more easily transcribed and it's thought to be more responsive to the needs of the neuron managing the brain serotonin levels. So basically, it works better than the short allele. The short allele actually slows down the synthesis of the serotonin transporter. So if we go back, we're talking about this thing right here. The long allele um, works better for the serotonin transporter. It does a better job of transporting the serotonin back into the neuron, while the short allele takes longer. And that's important because Stress increases your serotonin, uh, your, ser your need for serotonin. So the more stressed you are, the more serotonin you need to help regulate your mood levels. However, if you have the short allele, you're not going to be able to recycle serotonin as fast, meaning you can't have as much serotonin as you need, meaning you'll probably be stressed for longer. Natasha. Uh, so is, are the different alleles um, genetically do you have some genetics? Is that how yes. It? It's, the gene itself has two different alleles. And alleles are on the chromosome, remember? Mm -hmm. So you can either, you can be um, homozygous for the long allele, homozygous for the short allele, or heterozygous with the long allele and the short allele. Okay. Any more questions? I know this is kind of new to you guys. All right, just feel free to raise your hand. Okay, so we've talked a bit about stress. So I'd like you to complete, uh, we're going to switch topics a little bit, but I promise this all relates back to each other. So I'd like you to complete question three on your worksheet, which is what environment and or surroundings make you feel stressed and why? And an environment is just your surroundings. Maybe it's your uh, life at home, maybe it's your life at school, maybe it's a sports team, something like that. But what's something that makes you feel stressed?
All right, does everybody have something written down? Okay, can I have another volunteer to share what they wrote? <coughs> All right. Okay, so uh, I said school, sports, expectations, um, college, deadlines, and the bio expo. <laughs> what do you mean by expectations? Can you uh, talk about that a little more? Right, so like when, um, like when something's expected of me or like uh, I feel like I have to do something well, or like I, I'm supposed to like pitch well or play well or whatever it might be, and then it just puts a lot of pressure on me. Right. Oh, that's definitely, I'm sure, something all of us experience. Um, does anyone else have something new that is to share? How about, does anyone have a specific environment? Maybe a specific place? Yeah, actually. Um, waiting rooms. Ooh. Kind of like, get the anxiety and anticipating. That's a great example. Yeah, I think some of us, I know I hate to sit in the waiting room sometimes, but it's worse than that, for like appointment or whatever. Yeah, Lisa. It's like, like um, this reading test of the SAT or AD. guys feel stressed, but maybe something that makes you feel stressed doesn't make another person feel stressed, or vice versa. So maybe someone says, man, I have to eat a lot of chocolate. I'm so stressed. And you may be thinking, oh, that's the best thing ever. <laughs> Stress is subjective, just like mood and levels are. So actually, um, even researchers can't agree on a medical definition of stress. There are a couple that I found that try and pinpoint it. One is a physical, mental, or emotional strain or tension. Kind of sounds like what you guys were talking about. Um, a condition or feeling experienced when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources the individual is able to mobilize. Yeah, I guess. Um, the best one I found was everyone knows what stress is, but nobody really knows. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> Have you ever told someone, oh, I feel so stressed, and they say, why? It doesn't make sense to them. That's kind of why. So everyone really knows what it is, but it's different for every person. Researchers have been able to determine, though, that there are two kinds of stress. Uh, your stress, which is good stress. Well, what does that mean? Basically, it's that they can increase their productivity without hurting their physical, mental, or emotional well-being too much. So uh, an example of your stress is maybe you, uh, your favorite subject is math, and you have a good grade in math, but the topic you're learning about right now, you don't really get, but you feel pretty good, you have a test tomorrow, you're under a little bit of pressure, but it's not that bad. That's kind of your stress. You feel this little motivation to, oh, I should study harder to keep my grade up, but it's okay because I like the class. That's your stress. Distress or bad stress is when a person is so determined to complete a task that their physical, mental, and or emotional well-being suffers accordingly. So, I'm going to take, I had another example, but I like Lisa's of the SAT. Now, I'm sure none of you probably hurt yourselves too much over taking the SAT, but there are reported cases of some people that have, you know, just, they don't sleep, they don't eat, they don't do anything but study for this test, and then once the test day comes, they're so stressed because they're like, I have to get into this college because I have to have this future, and this has to be like this that they don't do well at all. That's distress. That's where you're actually harming yourself trying to do something. And distress is the kind of stress that uh, researchers are looking into in relation to major depressive disorder. Okay, so the environment, we talked about what an environment is and how its factors can cause stress. So there is this study done in South Korea using something called cognitive behavior therapy, and that's just a form of psychotherapy that emphasizes um, an important role of thinking in how one feels and what one does. It really relies on the Socratic method, so they question everything, like, how are you feeling? Why are you feeling like this? What can you do to not be feeling this? They ask a lot of questions, and that's supposed to help the patients discover, oh, this is what I need to do to get better. So um, they use the cognitive behavior therapy in different environments with patients diagnosed with major depressive disorder during pharmacotherapy. And that just means they were on medication. So there were three groups that they tested on. The usual outpatient management, and that was the control group since they've done it in the outpatient management before and they know the statistics of it. One 